I will. Uh, I have been discussing with Kim how to do this, and and the plan is that I will just give you a general uh, introduction into the topic, what we call planetary health, uh, and try to sort of describe it and and uh, compare it with One Health and and maybe other concepts uh, regarding the same topics and issue. Uh, and I was thinking to do that by sort of telling a personal story in a sense, how I got involved in these uh, uh, things and, and, and the reason for that. So I will try to make it a little bit personal. I think maybe it becomes a little bit more interesting then. And, but the first thing I want to tell you is that in the fall of 2019, I, I joined the World Health Summit in Berlin, actually. Um, and uh, this is the World Health Summit. It, it's a very big conference with many disciplines, politicians, uh, economics, all kinds of different scientists, even, even the army was present in, in Berlin in 2019. And they discuss big important topics for global health and, and, and uh, particularly maybe and also other issues. And for the last years, of course, these big challenges of climate change and, and uh, the changing paradigm of, of global health has been um, central in the discussions. And during one of these talks, uh, in, in, in the audience, all kinds of high-profile people sitting, there was a very interesting and funny German doctor. He was, uh, he's an entertainer and a, and a doctor, like this Norwegian Berglund or, or uh, Trondigo Torbjörn you can compare to. And I remember he said loud to the audience, you know, do you really think activism is a bad thing? No, I don't think so. I think we need more activism. And those words I remember so well because I, I, I have to say I agree with him. And activism doesn't have to be something rebellious or, or, or that you have to get in trouble with the police. It, it's, it's really to, to speak up for the topic you believe in and, and to try to front it. And, and uh, I remember those words really well. Maybe I've been an activist all my life, I guess. I guess I, guess I have. But, you know, these days in the position I'm in, I'm really trying just to focus on, on the big questions that I think it's important to discuss. So, so that's the story, or that's not the story, that's just an example. This, the story for me started, I, I graduated from medical school in 99 and quickly started my uh, specialization for infectious diseases and I did my PhD, uh, sort of uh, jumped into the hamster wheel uh, and, and stayed in, in the clinics for almost 20 years. Uh, and then I, I became more and more concerned about and, and uh, involved in climate change and pollution and all these things. So, so I decided I wanted to get off the hamster wheel and try to do something else and try to use my education with the purpose of, of getting into planetary health. So I joined the Center for Global Health at the University of Oslo. And this was in 2017. Uh, and that was the first time ever I was introduced to the concept of one health, the, thing, the, the way of thinking, one health thinking. <clears throat> and this is not rocket science. One health is, is the acknowledgement that human health depends upon animal health and, and the condition in the environment around us. So I, I was really, I got really interested in this. And also I have to admit, I was a little bit ashamed that I've been a medical doctor for almost 20 years. I had never ever heard about that way of thinking. Uh, and uh, also it became, and the reason why I got into One Health is, is that I started to do research on AMR, antimicrobial resistance. And um, which is, Maybe the, the example per excellence for, for the relevance of, of one uh, health way of thinking because resistance developing in animal animals or in the environment are uh, definitely of relevance for human beings and vice versa. So, but quickly it became clear to me that in the one health concept, the environment was, was losing ground in a sense. It, 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 it didn't receive the attention it deserved. It was too much attention on animal health, human health, and the interconnectedness of those two. And the environment was basically almost ignored. So that made me, uh, or, or, or then I think it was a PhD student or, or some, I don't remember today, that introduced me to planetary health, which is a different, it, it's, it's the same, same, but different. Um, 
I like that picture you can see here on with, with a tree because this tree is, is this is exactly my favorite tree. It's it resembles my career. It goes forward but not in a straight line. And and art like that I think you only can find in nature, like that picture. So as you understand, I took that picture myself. Oh, I want to try to change. Yes. This is the, the one health way of thinking, you know, it's, it's commonly uh, pictured like a wheel like this uh, with these double arrows showing the interconnectedness of human beings, uh, animal populations and the environment. And this is from the AM, this is a picture we made for, for AMR uh, teaching. That's why you see the bacteria in the center, but, but that's, only for, that's only the reason for this one. So what are the great challenges that we, we are discussing? Some examples are, of course, climate change. It's, it's the biodiversity problem or declining biodiversity. Uh, the extinction of species. I'm sure that uh, Kim is going to mention that uh, a little bit later on. It's also deforestation at the same time as, as we have a short, short, uh, shortage of, of uh, usable land. And then, of course, pollution, air pollution, water pollution, lack of access to fresh water, and pollution in general. Plastics has been a very hot topic over the last years. Also, the changing of biogeochemical flows, that is, uh, the changing flow of carbon and phosphorus and, and even water because of human activity. We are changing this in, 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 the, um, in the environment and in the different uh, ecological niches. So this made me uh, aware of, of, of uh, planetary health, which is actually a rather new concept. It, it's, it was uh, launched by the magazine The Lancet, and this picture is from The Lancet, in 2015. And it, it was a result of the Rockefeller Lancet Planetary Health Commission. Uh, and they wanted to sort of change the focus from One Health, which, which uh, had existed for quite a few years, uh, to more to, to sort of a higher uh, level and to, to involve also the, uh, the, the, not only the animals and, and uh, human health, but also sort of the governance and the politics and economics and everything. Uh, so it's, I will try to show you a picture I made uh, to sort of show the differences between these ways of thinking. Uh, just some examples for you. Today you will hear Kim, she's an expert in this topic. She will talk quite a bit about uh, deforestation, animal kingdom, how humans, uh, um, how we sort of overuse the, the resources in nature and, and the potential consequences of this. But this is also has been discussed for many, many years. And this article is written in two, or published in 2005. So that is more than 15 years ago. And it links deforestation, for example, and, and the uh, hunting of wild animals with the emergence of zoonosis. Zoonosis, diseases that jumps from animals to humans. And also, if you Google, this is just a simple Google, deforestation and, and uh, epidemics, and then you will get this, uh, this hit. What is very interesting with this is that deforest, just look at the, at the title, deforestation is, a leading, is leading to more infectious diseases in human beings. When was it published? It's almost uh, uh, ironic, I think. It was published in November 2019 less than one month before the COVID-19 epidemic uh, emerged. So that is really uh, interesting that we have been discussing these things and it has been, we, we have done research on these things for years actually, uh, just waiting for, for an epidemic to emerge. So the difference between these different way of thinking, so you, you, I think this is easily pictured by these Russian dolls. As all, I guess you all know these dolls from before. So the smallest one is public health on a national level. Uh, global health, it's a human health on a global level. So it sort of embraces the public health in all different nations. One health, is, is, it's even bigger because it embraces 
uh, global health, public health, animal health, and supposedly uh, the health of the environment. But then planetary health, again, it, it, it also includes the climate change, uh, the environment in a broader spectrum. And Kim provided me this very nice slide, which also pictures the same. So planetary health, it's human civilization uh, and the natural systems that we depend on. Uh, Eco-health is another one which we could discuss. I have uh, more or less deliberately uh, ignored that, but that's also in the same line. But One Health, uh, as I said, it's, it's between humans, animals, and the environment, and the interconnectedness between these uh, um, topics. Global Health, only a human population on a global level, public health on a national level. So, when I got into this planetary health way of thinking, I, I, uh, I'm a little bit proud of that because I, I applied for becoming a member for the Planetary Health Alliance. Um, the Center for Global Health at the University of Oslo is actually the first institute in Norway that became a member. And it sent me to Stanford University also in 2019. Um, at a very big, very interesting conference. I think that's one of the most in interesting conferences I've been to, uh, with people from all over the world uh, get, getting together, from all different disciplines getting together. Not only medical doctors, it was all kinds of different sciences represented. I think it was more than a thousand people. I, I, I don't know, but it was huge. So many interesting talks and lectures. And then I met Kim the first time. Or maybe it's more correct to say that you found me because somebody told you that there was a guy from Norway coming to that conference. And if I remember correctly, you have to correct me if I'm wrong. You suddenly approached me and you said, hi, are you Christian? And then I, I never seen you before. And I said, how do you know that? Yeah, I knew there was a guy from Norway coming. And then I realized I was actually the only person from Norway present at the, this big international conference. And I started to look around and I noticed that I was the only person from Scandinavia present. After some days, I found a woman from Finland, but we were the only two. And that also is an interesting point, I think, because why is Scandinavia, why is Norway so out of these very important discussions and topics and, and research? We are, we are somehow uh, lagging behind in these very, very important things. But now things are changing and if there is one positive thing to say about COVID-19 it is that these topics has received a lot more attention over the last 10 months in Norway. So having said that I just I want to introduce Kim Gritschmacher and I'm very happy to do that because you are uh, a very knowledgeable person about all these topics and I want you or we ask you and that's why we have invited you to tell us more about this very fascinating thing, the back pic the, the, the picture behind emergence of new infectious diseases like the one, like the epidemic that we're in now. Thank you. So then I close my share screen. Well, thank you so much, Christian, for this really kind introduction and for telling our story of how we met. Um, indeed, I think actually I, there's little to correct you, but uh, was I think we both were, it was the first day and we went both to the same workshop, which is where I first saw you. And I think you asked a question or somehow you uh, made yourself known and that's how I recognize you. But um, wasn't that a workshop on biodiversity uh, loss and health? That is very possible. Yeah, so I think that that, <laughs> that's how we that's how we met. So it's it's actually it's quite fitting that uh, is a similar topic to where we're both now um, speaking. Um, so um, thanks also to to Sarah and the uh, Medical Students Association for having me here, and of course for Medical Doctors Against Climate Change. Um, I feel very honored, and now the pressure is on after I've been introduced in <laughs> such a positive way. Um, I hope I I'm not going to disappoint here. Um, so yeah, I, I, um, there's a lot to be said about One Health and planetary health and the commonalities and differences. And I do have some different views on it, but that's probably that would be beyond uh, today's topic. But um, 
yeah, it's, it could fill a whole evening discussions about whether planetary health is part of one health or vice versa and how much how anthropocentric so how much each of these approaches will put humans in the center and how that is might actually be part of the problem um, but again this is a whole different story but i'm i'm very excited and also from a personal point of view so i'm a i'm a veterinarian but i started out studying um, human medicine actually i worked in conservation before i went to university but i went to university to study medicine and become initially a medical doctor um, because i realized that the environmental problems that we had that we were facing had medical had health implications but while they had health implications health seemed to be like such an important and and powerful lever to address some of these environmental issues and to um to humanize them in a way that made them personal and immediate so that people would actually feel um that would would feel more personally um uh, touched by them and then hopefully be more willing to do something about them. So that was the reason why I started um, studying human medicine and then, um, or, or, you know, medicine for me now as a veterinarian, <laughs> there, are two, there are various different forms of medicine. So then I decided to, to switch to, to veterinary medicine because I, at least then I would learn, you know, more of a comparative medicine between species and learn more about different species. And that was then my entrance through conservation medicine was, which was my first integrated approach to health um, that then uh, led me to One Health and then planetary health approaches. But that's just in a, in a nutshell. Um, and let me now start talking about uh, the pandemic, its origins, and how that um, is all related to our relationship um, with the environment. So we'll see. Um, here we go. Can you see it? Yes. Oh, wonderful. All right. Um, so let me just jump straight in. Um, most, I'm probably just, first of all, just telling you everything you already know and preaching to the converted, but uh, just for completeness, um, I would like to touch on where this, the current pandemic came from. Um, so there's broad consensus that uh, it's a zoonotic pandemic. Um, of course, there, there are rumors again and again, did it come from a laboratory, um, this, that, the other, but just if you look at the, the history of, of this virus, the sars coronavirus 2 which is very closely related to the sars coronavirus one or sars coronavirus um, and how we do know where that came from and how that was found actually um, in, in civet cats and, um, and also raccoon dogs. Um, so it, it, it's actually not a surprise um, that th there are also similar ancestral hosts of, of, of this or that could be expected and we have very so very closely related viruses have been found in uh, in horseshoe bats, um, but we the, the exact time, place, and mechanism of the spillover is not clear. And what we also do not know, um, but many people suspect, is that there has been an uh, an intermediate host, so that the virus was likely transmitted to a different kind of animal, which then transmitted it to humans. But there's also a chance that it was directly um transmitted there are just some arguments against it when it comes to uh likelihood of of direct contact with horseshoe bats in china at the time um but there were some positive environmental samples found in the the, the famous market in in wuhan um uh, but there were also some initial cases that could not be connected to the market so that is a um it's it's it could be but it wouldn't have to be um the the source of 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 the um, initial outbreak and then the the consecutive um pandemic um yeah i'll just leave that at this and we can discuss further if there are any questions um so just now uh over a year later um now a, a mission from from who has been sent so there are 10 experts um that have been sent uh to china now to to look for the for the origins of of this uh of the current pandemic it was uh, aborted a couple of times but now it actually has taken place so i think they are still in quarantine because this reports from january 13th they're two weeks in quarantine and so uh, so scientists are, are on the go right now trying to find out where the current pandemic came from. Um, 
but just to go take a step back again and and talk about a little bit more about what what Christian mentioned already. Um, zoonoses um, are infectious diseases that move between animals and humans. So I have to use a slightly different uh, definition here from what uh, Christian used. You can tell he's a human doctor and I'm a veterinarian. So, and, and actually WHO went back with their definition. Um, so one of their original definitions, I think it was from 1959, was disease, infectious diseases that move between um, humans and, and non-human animals. And now I think they went back to uh, infectious diseases that move from animals to humans. But again, as a veterinarian, uh, I have to object. And first of all, all humans are one kind, one species of animal. And so I would just argue they are infectious diseases that move between animals and in including uh, the human um, homo sapiens species. Um, but that would lead to another uh, philosophical discussion. So let's just uh, leave it at that. Um, so um, emerging infectious diseases are those that we will, are concerned about when it comes to um, those that can turn into epidemics and pandemics. And there have been, so they, um, these are diseases that are either new or new in a new location or have spread to, to different uh, geographies where they have not previously uh, been found in or in new species. So, um, and these emerging infectious diseases and these events are dominated by, by zoonotic diseases. And um, this is a, a very famous, um, I'm, so I'm quoting a very famous um, a publication here from, from Jones from 2008. So it seems slightly outdated in the way it is, but it is still probably the most reliable data set that, that um, we have to go back and refer to. Yet um, some of the data that has accumulated and the events ever since um, seem to point even even more strongly in the same direction. So basically that um, the proportion of these um, emerging infectious disease outbreaks um, that are zoonotic, so that proportion is growing as well as the proportion within that that comes from wildlife. Um, so, and the frequency is also increasing between those events. And you can also see with some uh, more well-known ones, HIV is a very famous pandemic that came from, from uh, non-human primates, uh, chimpanzees um, among them, and the transmission through direct contact. Um, but also Ebola, also likely great apes and, and bats that play a role in that. And then of course, uh, influenza viruses, we all heard about the bird flu and the swine flu. and Sometimes there are intermediate hosts or so-called mixing vessels where these viruses jump from one species to another um, and then into humans. Um, and then, of course, um, SARS, we all know, know that. And there's also MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome uh, that also came from bats uh, to camels to um, humans. Nipah virus um, uh, and, and Hendra pyramidoviruses in, in Asia and in, in Australia that also have jumped from uh, bats to, uh, in the case of Hendra horses, um, to people. And in the case of Nipah, at least initially in Malaysia, these outbreaks uh, came from, from bats into pigs to humans. Um, but what we do know also is that there are roughly 700,000 unknown viruses currently present in wildlife that have the potential to jump um, to humans. So, uh, and now, of course, some might be tempted to say, well, why don't we just kill off all the wildlife and then we don't have to worry about those, um, those viruses anymore. And, you know, some people actually make those propositions. It's quite scary. But of course, that does not work. In fact, it has in the past culling um, attempts have actually backfired um, due to various parts of, of um, ecological reasons and dynamics. Um, but of course, not only, so particularly if, if bats seem to be um, uh, more often uh, the, the culprit, which it, it's a bit of a misconception only also, well, in part because there are so many different. So there's a huge diversity within bats and the diversity of the viruses kind of correlates with the diversity of the species. But um, um, the bats are also really important and integral parts of ecosystems and they have very important functions. Um, the in insectivores um, eat insects and for instance they can control um, other infectious diseases that are being transmitted by mosquitoes for instance but they also are pest controls in, in agricultural landscapes and um, they are um, particularly also the, the fruit bats are important um, 
uh, important for also for for crops and 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 bats are important pollinators so so um, it's not as easy to say well let's just get rid of all wildlife or all bats and then that's that um, first of all there are many other species that also carry viruses that can jump to humans and also all of these wildlife species do play a role in their ecosystems which um, provide important functions um, for humans um, and of course some may even argue um, they are an important part of nature and that has a value in itself but that uh, again is a more philosophical discussion um, let's see so um, here's just um, to show how and where um, some of these viruses may jump or how um, the uh, the, deg the level of degradation um, also brings so an increased degradation of habitat brings uh, more contact with humans and because you know there are um, actually these spillover events are rare but if we increase the contact rates then we increase increase the chances of them spilling over so the more contact we actually have the more opportunities we provide for pathogens to jump species um, and so this is why we would like to or you know it's it's really recommendable to keep the um, um, the frequency of contact really low. Um, of course, there also it matters what kind of contact there is, etc. But the but the um, just the uh, the amount, the frequency of contact is is also really important in this. So, and if you, you can see here, um, you know, an, an, an undisturbed habitat, um, you will only have very limited contact between humans and wildlife on the fringes of that. But when when you do um, cut into, let's say, a forest, then you create um, a, a lot more um, contact opportunities um, for humans along roads, for instance, along log logging roads, or, you know, the loggers will also have camps and they will need to eat and then, you know, they might can go hunt into the forest, et cetera, et cetera. So you do just create a lot more opportunities for contact with between wildlife and, and people. Um, and then, of course, in, in, uh, uh, on the right side um, of this graph, you see um, just a, a very, very high rate of contact between, between humans and, and wildlife here in, in a highly fragmented um, habitat. Um, so, so there are certain degradation multipliers, and that includes road building and mining and, and logging camps and urban settlements, uh, migration, war, and, and monocultures. Um, and this is just a very important panel that I, if, if, you, if you have not come across it, um, it's the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which was founded in, in uh, 2012, I believe. Um, and it's a, it's a very important platform that, um, that brings together scientists and, and, and um, writes reports, accumulates evidence on particularly on, on uh, biodiversity and, um, and ecosystem services. Um, that's their core. Um, uh, focus, um, but of course, last year they also got together, got an expert panel together to look into um, the relationship of um, biodiversity loss and and the um, the pandemic. Um, and so they put out a report. So this was in July. Twenty two experts, international experts, um, met for a workshop, um, and. Uh, so the, some of the key messages here are also that pandemics emerge from the microbial um, diversity found in nature and that the human ecological disruption and unsustainable consumption drive pandemic risk. Um, and that land use change, agricultural expansion and urbanization cause more than 30% of the um, emerging disease events. And these are just some key messages from the report in July. Um, but going back to the more global report or assessment that was published in, I think it was May 2019, um, where um, they also pointed towards the, um, uh, actually they, they, uh, they came up with five direct drivers of global change in, in nature and um, biodiversity loss. Um, and those are changes in land and sea use, um, the direct exploitation of organisms, including the wildlife trade, um, and climate change. And so these three also, interestingly, very much overlap with, with drivers of emerging infectious diseases. And so this should tell us really something. If, if they have similar origins um, and if there's a, an overlap in them um, in, in terms of where this comes from, then maybe this is where we should be looking for solutions that could help us 
um, tackle some of these major crises, the ecological crises, the, the risk of future pandemics, and also, of course, the climate crisis. And um, so this is just a slide that I like to include, because if, if you can't uh, convince people of the importance of um, you know, the, the intrinsic value of, of nature or the importance of healthy um, wildlife or, um, or even the, uh, uh, the, the importance of, of global health, um, then the, the economic argument sometimes um, does convince people because this, this pandemic is extremely costly. And because we see an increase in the, in, in the frequency of these emerging infectious disease events, and these are, you know, any one of them can, in theory, lead to a pandemic. I mean, this is always just the first step. You have a spillover, then potentially, if uh, you know, a few things come together, you have an outbreak, and then following possibly an epidemic, and from an epidemic, you know, this can turn into a pandemic. And with, with um, growing um, global population, human population, we have a higher density, we have more contact with one another, then we have increased mobility. So we are constantly creating better and better conditions for these spillovers that are increasing because, because of the growing population and we have more demand and, and want for resources. And so we, we break into these habitats, we increase the contact with wildlife, um, this leads to more spillover events, and then our our global connectedness and the density of populations, plus the the increased mobility on this planet, is likely to lead to more and more um, pandemics, and and. And so this is incredibly hard on all of us. I and mean, we all know now, we've now all are living through what it means. Um, and this is, this is just one pandemic. This is still in some ways, you know, relatively mild. I mean, it could be as a, as a disease, as an infectious disease could actually um, be, uh, it could be worse. And um, so, so, you know, at least if nothing else, we certainly don't want these, um, these, these costs at, at all human levels, you know, the, the, the health levels, psychological, mental, but also, of course, economic levels, because, uh, you know, so many people are affected by this. So, um, and when you look at what it would cost, it's just a fraction, um, what it would cost to prevent these, or at least if not prevent, because it's, it's, it's almost impossible to say, um, you know, we cannot just stop human wildlife contact from one day to the other, but we can lower the risk by, by, by decreasing the contact, by keeping habitats healthy um, and by protecting forests, which is also really good for the, for, um, for the climate. I mean, we, we can protect ecosystems that are carbon sinks, for instance, and um, promote um, natural solutions to climate change, which can make um, up one to a third of the solutions um, while, of course, um, fossil fuels will have to be left um, in the ground, it cannot also not solve all the problems, but it's part of it. So, um, so this is just, this was a little excursion, um, but what I wanted to say is if we do spend just a fraction of the money on preserving um, the forests um, and, and fighting wildlife change, the illegal wildlife change, and then very much reducing the legal um, then we can do something, then we can actually um, help to, uh, to tackle biodiversity and, and the, the ecological crisis. Um, and this has um, ancillary uh, benefits um, for, for the climate. Um, and we can save a lot of money and lower the risk of pandemics. So that seems, sounds like a, a win to me. And this is a, a, a slide that I'm sure that Christian has a few thoughts on this, and we discussed it briefly a little bit earlier. There are some signals, and I'm sure that many of you are frustrated maybe by politics, and, um, and it is something to be, of course, debated, the statements that are sometimes made at high panel uh, fora. Um, this is from the, the One Planet Summit um, just last week, um, January uh, 11th, and Anna Solberg uh, said the pandemic has hit us hard. Um, as we are dealing with its consequences, we must also think ahead. Protecting biodiversity will strengthen global resilience against future threats, including new viruses and climate change. And Angela Merkel said, we can only live well on a healthy planet with healthy animals and plants. And while these you know, might be interpreted um, as lip service, 
um, these are some important signals because in this year there will be um, the, the COP15, the Conference of the Parties um, on Biodiversity of the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity, and the, the new biological, um, the, the new targets are going to be um, decided. So every 10 years that happens, the current biodiversity targets are the IG targets, so they come to an end. We have globally, uh, collectively failed on all of them, we already know that. Um, and so this year in, in China, the, the, this is an important conference and this is leading up to the conference. So every signal from, from um, world leaders that, that do uh, take a stand for, for biodiversity protection is, is, from my perspective, crucial, even though, of course, um, it's debatable um, as long as this remains um, just statements. Of course, this will have to translate into to more tangible action. Um, and these are just at the, and now I just want to make some recommendations on, um, on some of the literature that I can, I can recommend. So in, in the, uh, this document on the left, you will find um, a lot of information on exactly what I was talking about, the links uh, between ecological integrity, emerging infectious disease originating from wildlife and other aspects of human health. So this literature overview, you will find uh, the uh, publication that Christian mentioned and, and many more that are all on a topic over the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years. Um, and then I can really also recommend the uh, Connecting Global Priorities um, by WHO and uh, the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity and the UN Environmental Program. Um, this is from 2015. And then for those of you who are not so much into reading technical reports, I can recommend Spillover. Um, it, that's very much focusing on the, on the um, pathogen side of things, but it also does touch on, on some of the um, broader issues. So, and I will leave it at that, otherwise I will uh, continue to talk for another three hours and probably just bore you to death. So let's uh, maybe have some questions. I will say thank you, Kim. And it's always very interesting to listen to you. Um, you sent me some questions when we discussed what to talk about and how to do this. And, and uh, I, I said that I was probably going to interrupt you in your talk, but I didn't do that because uh, you, are, you are in the flow and I just wanted that to continue. And, but some of the questions you sent me is that, of course, what <laughs> the most important questions is, what can we do? What can each individual do? What is the role of Norway? Uh, what have we learned from the COVID-19 pandemic? quite a bit i think i think we have learned quite a bit um and also i saw that there was a question or was a comment from turbjorn or somebody in, in the in the chat and i'm sorry if you know i i mentioned that one health was more or less unknown in norway and then i talked about in the medical community i know that the veterinarians they have been discussing this for years and years and and that makes me think of one thing i think is really important trying to sort of address these issues and and these topics mm -hmm. that is collaboration across disciplines it's it's that we have to sort of tear down the silos and veterinarians um ecologists um human medicine medical doctors etc how to start to talk more openly about these issues. And that is really, really important in, in the public health aspect, in, in my opinion, at least. And then, of course, when you, when you quote Anna Solberg, uh, Anna Solberg, she, she has done a lot of great things, but she's also very good at sort of having wonderful talks and speeches. And, and in Norway, we are sitting in one of those countries in the world producing most oil and gas and still saying that we have to do something about the climate change. So there is some, at least I personally react to that a little bit. You know, it's, it's one thing is what you say. Another thing is what actually is being done. So, so, so that's only one thing. Um, what do you think we can do about these things, uh, Kim? I, th I think what, what you do um, and also uh, like, I have to say from a, from a veterinarian point of view, um, medical doctors are, are, have a very powerful standing um, in society. So you really have a voice and, and, and a standing and um, are trusted by people. And that is incredibly powerful. So, but um, if I may say, so it, it does come with maybe a bit of a responsibility too. So I think that um, I would really appreciate if human doctors do what I see many do these days or get together and, and 
build alliances and um, starting to community among uh, to communicate among um, each other, but also then to other people, because it's such a trusted group um, that um, it, it really can make a difference. So, so you know, there, there are, of course, initiatives about greening the, the health sector, which I think is important. Um, and when you when you listen to some of the talks by Sabina Gabrisch and 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 other um, incredible people out there who who have been voices in this, in you have this to field. you have to tell the audience who Sabina Gabrisch is. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yes, she she is a she's a professor for she's in Germany. She's a, our first professor for climate change and health. Um, between two institutes, the, uh, the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research and the Charité University Hospital. So, um, and, and she gives really inspiring presentations and she always talks about the, the handprint and the footprint. And so she's, she talks about how we all um, can, you know, make a difference also through activism or through, you know, voting and through um, initiatives. This can be, you know, petitions and letters and getting together. Um, we really can make a difference at so many levels. Of course, there's also our daily life, how we consume, what we eat, um, what we don't eat, <laughs> you know, how we drive, how we, you know, do we use the bicycle, do we use the car, um, do we always have to travel to Southeast Asia in our, um, in our holidays, or can we maybe just take a bike trip to somewhere. So, of course, there are things that we can do and integrate in our everyday lives, um, and of course, food, I think, is food and, and mobility are, are two major um, uh, levers here. Um, but it's also about what we do, like how we talk, how we how we talk with each other and, and how we whether or not we join movements that, um, you know, um, that actually communicate to the broader public and to politics. Um, and yeah, hopefully. And by the way, do you know which group is more trusted than medical doctors in the society? Nurses. <laughs> yes, I like that. I yes. like that. <laughs> yeah, that's what's... <laughs> So that is healthcare, yeah. healthcare personnel. <laughs> healthcare yeah, absolutely, personnel. absolutely, yes, absolutely. I, I would be curious that study did not include veterinarians. I would, I would be curious where they fall. But I just also do remember that politicians are very, very much not trusted. They are on the other end of the spectrum. That so, is true. Together with journalists. Yes. <laughs> yes. So and and with that trust, and that's what I mean, comes a certain level of responsibility. So you know, being a voice for these topics, I think, is um, is incredibly important. Yes, and I think what what you answered now is basically also the the answer for the question: what what has the pandemic taught us? In a sense, you know, what can we learn from the pandemic? And and for example, it's it's. I guess you all have seen these pictures of Delhi and Beijing, you know, suddenly they could see the, the, the blue sky again for the first time in 10 years because uh, reduction of traveling and, and air traffic. So mm -hmm. it's possible. It's possible. It's about our behavior. That's, that's the solution in a sense. Sara, I think maybe, do you want to ask some questions or do you have any feedback from the audience or anything? Um, I must first say thank you so much both of you for very interesting uh, lectures and talks and I think I speak on behalf of everyone when I say that it's very interesting and inspiring to listen to. Uh, I just noticed um, that uh, Celia asked a question and that is, is there increase in infections moving from humans to animals as well? Uh, regarding deforesting and nature destruction. And I can see that, Kim, you, you have something to say uh, about this. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. That's, uh, that's because it, it touches on what I worked on in my, in my PhD thesis. So this is actually a very specific talk, topic. I worked on anthropozoonosis or reverse zoonosis. zoonosis. So yes, infectious diseases jumping from humans into, in my case, wildlife. So I was looking into uh, respiratory pathogens jumping from humans into great apes, wild great apes, chimpanzees and gorillas and bonobos. Um, and um, yes, yes, that is a concern. Um, it is, I would, I would argue that it is largely understudied because humans are selfish and they are, don't usually care about what happens to other animals unless they are of some kind of use for us. I mean, I have to maybe say, say it so clearly, but you know, we have the, the livestock and the animals that produce the food for us. And then maybe we use others as pets or uh, for sports. But um, but usually beyond that, we don't really care so much about it, and there's no money, there's no 
very few people in a care. And so the great apes are a bit different because we, we are interested in their behavior. And this is also how it came about, how um, uh, the research that I was working on was inspired because since the 1960s, um, we were seeing since um, one of the 1950s, these um, the habituation pro program started, famous one, for instance, by Jane Goodall and, and others. Um, um, so the, the increased contact there then, and also us researching their behavior led us to observe that they often had similar disease outbreaks than the humans in which they were in contact with. And then that led to, um, to more interest and more research, but also because these animals were being followed every day, uh, we knew their, um, and still do know their, uh, their, their names, who they are, their life histories, etc. They're highly valuable for science, for um, anthropological research on also on the origins of humans and behavior, etc. cognitive research, all of that. So um, because of that, um, they have a special role. So we do care about their health because it takes years and a lot of money to get them to the point where they actually accept us in their uh, proximity. And so, so that, uh, that's why we look into some of the pathogens that jump into them. Um, and of course, now in the course of the pandemic, we've had tigers and the Bronx Zoo that were infected. Uh, you know, now there also are great apes and zoos that have been infected. We know of the, um, uh, the Natsa, what's the, sorry, what's the... Uh, what, what in, the, is the ferrets in, in, yeah, the in, ferrets in the, Denmark. ferrets in Denmark, how did yeah. they get the SARS-CoV-2, you know, I think it was yes. from humans, so... From people, yes. But other than us, again, being concerned about the the, um, the dynamics of the pandemic, you know, we rarely care about what the what the animals get from us. Um, but my yes, so there are um, anthropozoonoses, and uh, we also do have, um, you know, but it's more anecdotal cases of, of let's say elephants getting infected by by humans um, with tuberculosis. There are so there are cases of that. Um, um, but they are under-researched and they don't get a lot of um, attention and generally people do not care too much unless it's their pet or it has an economic um, consequence, then unfortunately we often do not care so much. Maybe this could be a, a, some sort of criticism to plantar health actually, because you know, plantar health, it puts human health in the center and, and yeah. how all the other factors affect human health. So yeah. it's not truly, it's not truly uh, holistic. Okay. Yeah. No. Yeah. Hmm. Agreed. Yes. Actually, there are papers on that. Um, I, I, I can send you, or, or I can actually send it to, to you, Sarah, as well, if you want to post it somewhere. So there are some papers exploring exactly that the um, anthropocentric nature of, of planetary health, mm -hmm. and but there are some planetary health groups actually that are not. Uh, that that have seem to have different approaches to it. So as Sabine Gavish likes to say, also you know that the, these different um, integrated health approaches, like One Health and Planetary Health, they are as different in within them as they are between them. So depending on the people that kind of practice them, um, you have massive differences um, in in terms of the the approach um, to it. And anthropocentrism would be one of my major criticisms of any of these holistic um, approaches and the, but that includes one health depending on who, who practices it uh, it's just as anthropocentric mm. thank you uh, Kim uh, and also I'm, I'm wondering uh, since uh, there are a lot of uh, medical students and also I think some nursing students and veterinarians uh, listening to I'm wondering you you guys mentioned this about doctors uh, being highly trusted and that it's important to use uh, our voices. How can students uh, contribute to all of this? Uh, students still in school, what can we do? Excellent question. Christian, do you want to comment? I'm, I'm, and now I'm sitting looking at you, Sarah, because don't you have a group? <laughs> Wow. The, sim the, 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 sim the simple answer is, I think just to be active and, and to, to be engaged is very important. And, and, and uh, I, I'm so fond of, of the students' enthusiasm. And, and just look at what you're doing now. You know, you arranged this webinar. It's not the Norwegian Medical Association to do it. So, so, so how would you answer that question, Sarah? 
uh, because you are very you are very much engaged uh, aren't you uh, well i think i think there is something about what you said uh, before i really like um the way you you said like breaking down the silos i'm not sure if you can say that in english but it's a very good uh, saying in norwegian at least to cooperate with others and i think uh, for me as a student i find a lot of inspiration in listening to you guys who work with it and to find knowledge other places and to maybe just find people and co-students who are concerned with the same as you and then discussing together and taking initiative to just something I think it's like you say, uh, Christian, that we need maybe more activism. So I think doing something is better than doing nothing. And sometimes when yeah, you're feeling a bit like uh, apathetic and uh, helpless, it helps to be around people who cares about things. That yeah. helps a lot. That helps a lot to socialize with other people, sort of being having the same concerns and being involved in the same thing. It's really important, I think. It's it, Because if you sit by yourself, yeah, you feel useless yeah. very quickly very quickly yeah, very quickly and i think as students we are very uh, i think a big trap for students is to feel that you you don't know enough you're not uh, knowledge knowledgeable enough but i think that's a bit like uh, thoughts that should be put away because everyone can con contribute with something yeah yes yes okay um so we started off a bit uh, late, so I think if anyone has any questions, uh, please feel free to write in the chat or to just ask uh, uh, to unmute yourself. But I, I also want to just uh, say that we have had some great comments from uh, Martin Herman, a colleague of you, Kim, is that a, yeah? Uh, yeah, so uh, greetings to Norway from Munich, uh, Martin says, and he has uh, posted a great online course it looks like so it's a 90 hour course and with global participation and uh, with a link to it so anyone who feels like they want to do more maybe that is a way to to start and also check also out it says health for future and find your local health for future group and maybe as a member of doctors uh, norwegian doctors against climate change i can uh, say that uh, become a member Yes, yeah. I support that. I support yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, so we have uh, both a student group and um, membership for uh, doctors. And as uh, you mentioned, Christian, we have a Torbjörn Refsum. He also mentions that there uh, is a veterinary climate action right now. Uh, so please check that out. Yeah. And we should get together the medical uh, doctors against climate change and the veterinarians against climate change. We should definitely get together. And also, I think, Sara, we should mention if there are any nursing students, I th there is no problem for nursing students to become members in the in the Legnes Klimaaktion, which we call yeah. it in Norwegian. Yeah. That's a good comment from Christian. Open for all uh, health uh, health workers. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And uh, and maybe maybe there could be some joint um, meeting with with the with the German students at some point. Um, I think there you know there could be very interesting to have a bit of an exchange. Um, the initiatives that that Martin is is is, is running in, in in Germany are also now um, there. There seems to be more exchange with other uh, European countries. So I've I've heard of um, some exchange with Belgium and then with Austria and Switzerland. So it seems like you know this might also be interesting to to exchange on a on a European level. I think that's a very good, uh, very good initiative. Yeah. Okay. So let's hope maybe in the future, uh, uh, Kim, you will meet more Scandinavians and not only Christian in. Uh... <laughs> Maybe one day the, the planetary health uh, meeting will be held in, in, in Norway. Who knows? Yes, <laughs> that, that would be perfect. Amazing. Okay, so uh, time is uh, running away from us. So I think maybe I can't see any more uh, questions, but I think I must say one once more thank you so much to both Christian and, uh, and you, Kim, for participating. And, planning this webinar and organizing it and for inspiration and uh, knowledge that you shared.
So, and thank you to everyone who participated. Uh, it was nice to see so many interested. Um, yes. So I think that's that. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, thank you so much, and Christian for organizing yes. and for inviting me. I wish you, wish you a nice evening, all of you. Goodbye.